the stock market is the biggest asset bubble we've seen in terms of U.S. stocks in the history of this country. When this bubble breaks, and we think it's begun to break, we expect a bear market that'll last a couple of years, like most bear markets, but it will be devastating in its social ramifications, economic, real world ramifications, not just to the one percenters, but to everybody, much like the 2009 thing was, but this is a much bigger bubble. It's scary when you look at the charts. We're probably at the beginning of a major bear market, not a pullback. Uh, the I suggest to anybody who's got uh, can get price charts on their quote screens or on their computers, go look at an S and P 500 monthly bar chart. Uh, go back to 2000, at least two. Go back 20 years, okay, to see the big bull market that peaked in 2000 in the bear market, and which crushed a lot of people. You know the dot com bubble, and then go look at the next peak that occurred in 2007 which led to the 2008-2009 bear market, which devastated a lot of people, not just in the stock market, but in, in reality. It was, a, it was a major disruption. Lehman Brothers, remember all that? Okay. And then look at what happened since then. A dozen years of verticality. I mean, it makes those prior bull market bubbles. We call it, Remember, they call it the dot-com bubble. When you look at that chart, it looks like a little hump. And in the 2007, a little hump. And when you look at what's happened since, and understand and appreciate why it's happened. Not the excuse that this company did that and that company did that and all these little minor, minor things. The central bank of the US get a chart from the St. Louis Fed on the M2 chart, money supply two, and Fed funds rate chart going back covering that same period of time. And you'll understand why the stock market went vertical because they printed it higher. They put interest rates effectively at zero for more than a decade. I mean, it went up to two and a half at one point. But when you compare the Fed funds rate chart going back 40 years, 20 years or whatever, and see where we were with those prior bull market peaks bubbles, and then see what how they responded with their Fed funds rate when those bear markets began. They came in and lowered rates again, of course, and flushed the money system full. This time, they've left their foot on the pedal for a dozen years. So... We argue that this is a fundamental argument that the stock market is the biggest asset bubble we've seen in terms of U.S. stocks in the history of this country. When this bubble breaks and we think it's begun to break, we expect a bear market that will last a couple of years like most bear markets, but it will be devastating in its social ramifications, economic, real world ramifications, not just to the one percenters, but to everybody. Much like the 2009 thing was, but this is a much bigger bubble. It's scary when you look at the charts. Now, when we do our momentum work, we don't look at the price charts primarily. Uh, we look at, right now we're looking at long-term momentum of the stock S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100, which is where they house most of those high uh, heavy-weighted stocks like Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Google, etc. They're extremely heavily weighted stocks and they're a large factor in why those indexes went up so much, especially the NASDAQ 100. And even those stocks, four or five stocks uh, of name, constitute like 20% of the S&P 500. And so they explain partly why, you know, when the money went in, it went into the stocks and drove the indexes up. Uh, therefore, we're measuring the momentum trend of the S&P, the NASDAQ 100, and three of those symbols, Microsoft, Amazon, and Apple. We figure when those three go, it's over. You don't even have to look at the indexes. Uh, we'll argue that if you think you can escape by finding some little area off to the side that's going to survive this, it's not. The whole thing will go. They will go more on a percentage basis. But we've had some significant momentum trend breakage. Now, when we plot our momentum charts, we end up with a different picture than what you look at when you see a price chart. Price chart only just began to break. Momentum began to break before price did. And in the process of breaking down, the momentum charts broke structures, meaning the same kind of thing. If you look at a price chart, you draw a trend line, let's say, or you draw a floor on the price chart and you break it. Well, that's a structure. OK, we apply those same concepts to momentum measurements. And usually momentum will break trend change up or down prior to when price does it. So you get a warning. But the dimensionality of these breakages, we're breaking annual momentum trend structures, not something that goes back 10 weeks, something that goes back, you know, we're talking 10, 15 years of, of, of definable trend structures. The NASDAQ 100 last month broke all of our intermediate and then long-term structures, closed the month out below everything we could define as defining a top. Okay. 
The S&P 500 broke them intramonth, came back in the last three hours of trading. We had to find a number. If you close the S&P below 4484 was the number. Okay, It got all the way down to 4200 and something, came back in the last few days of the month and closed. And we called that rally, by the way, when the, the low day. We said it was, it was a 4300. Then we said, watch out, you're probably going to go back to 4500. And sure enough, there's been that rally. And it happened to occur at the tail end of the month. So they closed the month out like a half percent above our breakage defined number for annual momentum of the S&P. So we have a bit of a disagreement there. NASDAQ says, I'm broken. S&P 500 says, eh, not so sure yet. Then when we go to our three big stocks, Amazon is clearly broken. Now it's having a nice rally right now, but it broke its annual momentum big time at higher levels than we are now. Microsoft and, and Apple month got below our structural levels, but then popped back above it in the last hours of trading at the end of January, just like the S&P, and marginally closed safe. We still think they're likely to break. And once we get the full defined breakage by including Microsoft and Apple into that negative category, and the S&P closing below its new number for this month, which is, we're below it right now, frankly. Uh, so this rally we just had in the stock market, It not only has to hold, it has to gain more ground because if it just goes up to where it's gone now and then fiddles around between now and the end of the month, we'll break the numbers we had last month because they adjusted higher this month. Okay, enough of that technical stuff. But if the stock market breaks down and we've already dropped 10 percent, our first major swing objective on the downside is a 20 percent drop off the highs. We've got some reasons for that. It's not because it's the rounded number. We think there's some support around 3,800 on the S&P. Well, where did we drop from? We went from 4,800 down under 4,300, about halfway to that target. And that's where we created this little rally, which makes some sense. Because if you're going to go from Z to A, somewhere halfway in between, you might have a 50% correction, you know, a little corrective rally in the middle of the trend. And most of the time when we analyze various sectors in the NASDAQ 100, our objective on the first drop is about a 20% off the high drop. And at that point, you might get a protracted couple months of holding effort, okay? What investors need to remember is that bear markets in the U.S., with the sole exception of 1929, do not commence with crashes. They commence with arm wrestling. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. If you go back and examine the 2000 top, the dot-com bubble top, it was arm wrestling for almost a year for the S&P 500 in particular, before it finally then gave up 50% in the S&P and then as they gave up like 80-something percent. But it wasn't instant. There was no crash at the beginning. There was no emotional alarm bell. It was the kind of action that confused people. Because, you know, you get a drop and then somebody says, buy it, it's an opportunity, right? And then it rallies. You say, well, see, it's not really a bear market. So they confused you all the way down. Uh, That's the way bear markets behave. But even in 29, when you had your first crash, you had a rally 50% of the way back to the high in March of uh, 1930. And then you went into your arduous bear market for two years. So what we're expecting here is similar behavior. The problem is that the breakage of this bull market is the breakage of the biggest bubble we've ever seen. And uh, the culprit is the central bank, not just the Fed, but the ECB in Europe and the BOJ in Japan. They created these situations. We've done a better job of doing it because our market's gone up more ballistically than have their markets, for sure. So we're the bubble. Now, the Fed says, okay, we're going to tighten up and correct this inflation problem. Well, go back and look in December, where the Bloomberg Commodity Index was, was trading down in the mid 90s on the index, 95 area. It's, it rallied since then to 110. Okay, so the threat of the Fed to curtail the commodity explosion, which is coming up out of a very deep price hole, an opposite bubble almost, downside, it's coming, it's coming to life, has not succeeded in stopping commodities. But what's it done? It's broken the S&P 500 10% off its high, and NASDAQ 100 more than that. It's seriously damaged the muni bond market. There's an ETF called MUB. You can look it up and look at the chart. It's taken out the lows of the last year and a half. And you can go to the corporate debt market, especially the high yield corporate debt. Uh, There's a couple ETFs there. And these are instruments, by the way, that the Federal Reserve actually bought 
put on their books in starting in mid-2020 through the summer of 2021. They were buying these things, JMK is an ETF of high-yield corporate debt, and uh, HYG is another one. They've taken out the lows of the last year and a half. So what's become, what's gotten intimidated by the Fed's policy shift are not the asset categories they want to intimidate. They're the bubble assets they created themselves. And they, they've put the pin in the bubble. And, it, and our argument is that likely what you're really seeing here is when the Fed turns on the river of liquidity, and when they see the stock market, especially if it gets 20% off the high, and cause sentiment damage, investor sentiment damage, uh, economic analysis uh, metrics will start to shift with the stock market. Stock market usually leads those things into negative territory, not the other way around. Uh, then the Fed's going to have to rethink their policy shift. And already some of those events have started to happen. Like I said, those the junk bond market, the mini bond market, these are areas that the Fed does not want to see go down. So all this talk, uh, tough talk about we're going to do this and that, uh, there's realities out there that could put them into a different mode, subtly. <laughs> and in fact, we, we dissected Powell's statement that he made at the end of the last meeting. We had a press conference. He came out with a statement first. We dissected a couple of the paragraphs there where there were some ifs, ands, and buts in there, if you read very carefully. And so our argument is that when the bubble breaks, the Fed is going to have to respond as its sole savior. And the problem is that when they do respond again by trying to support those markets or providing liquidity or maybe not raising rates as much or at all as they said they would, that the river flow this time is not going to go into the broken bubble. It's going to go into the lesser priced asset categories. And that would be commodities and commodity related stocks, which are doing quite well, as you know. Um, oil stocks are doing great. They've been doing great for a year or so. And they're not in sync with the stock market, by the way. You go back and look at the XLE ETF of energy stocks. They don't correlate well with the major direction of the U.S. stock market for the last five or 10 years. So they could easily have an uptrend while the stock market goes down. Other areas uh, we recommended over a year ago were fertilizer stocks. They were beat off the page, along with most agricultural related stocks. They've trended up. They've tripled in price in the last year. They're likely to continue. So from an investor point of view, if you're looking for places to be, focus mostly on commodity related assets, not necessarily the futures markets, but you know things related to farming, uh, grain prices, fertilizers, one of them, um, and focus your attention there as possible places to be long stocks. But the rest of the market is uh, highly vulnerable. And if we're correct on this, and I think we're going to be, uh, We've not missed a major market top in our existence since MSA was founded in 1992. So, and I think this one's in process. And uh, we'll get some more evidence, I think, by the end of this month that, in fact, it is a full court press to the downside. Uh, but the beneficiary of that will be that liquidity flow that the Fed will, Fed will no doubt create. They do it every time one of their bubbles start to break. will go not where they want it to go. Investors are already preferring, and including some large asset managers of name, that aren't gold bugs, but they perceive value, less risk, greater reward in commodity related stocks because they see historically the commodity prices, though they've had a sharp move up, are nowhere near off the page in terms of historic price levels. Uh, Bloomberg right now at 110, for example, well, heck, it was 180 in 2011. You know, compare that with the stock market versus 2011, okay? so. Uh, that's a place to be looking. And we think the prime beneficiary of this ultimately will be gold and silver of the, of the commodity price continuation and the upside. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn $500,000, $1 million, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. 
but there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof. To the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.